Okay, so everyone's seeing the presenter, or the uh, sorry, the, the 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 view. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, um, hello, good morning, everyone. My name is Barbara Gillardi, and I'm going to be presenting today on the ins and outs of creating surveys. Um. Sorry, um, are we, are we, yeah, let me make sure everyone's seeing. Okay, everyone's good, okay. Um, and so uh, I'm gonna be covering, I did do a, a short um, presentation uh, a couple of weeks ago in a another uh, presentation that folks might have attended. So if you did attend that, there may be a bit of overlap, but I, I noticed that quite a few folks were not at that. Um, webinar a couple of weeks ago that I presented with Gail and Dawn. So um, I'm going to go ahead and kind of do a little bit of overlap. So you might hear some things again if you uh, did attend. Um, okay. And let me go to the next slide. Okay. So um, here's what we're going to cover today. Um, we're going to talk about the value of using surveys to collect data. Uh, different types of surveys, survey questions, survey design principles, uh, survey distribution, and then results, what comes next. And I will say that I'm going to probably spend, I am going to spend more time on design principles than I am more on results and um, sharing. So if you have questions about that, feel free to ask um, as we go along. And actually, if you have questions anytime during the presentation, feel free to ask. Um, you can either put them in the chat or you can raise your hand and um, my colleague Gail is on and she'll help me keep track of there's, if there's any questions as we go along. Okay. So why do a survey? And so if you're thinking about uh, starting a survey, creating a survey, um, probably the big reason why you wanna do one is to get feedback from your community and your stakeholders. And you could be doing this for a variety of reasons. Um, it could be something as bi big as kind of a piece of your strategic planning, or maybe you just want feedback on a specific service you have that you're, you've been doing or some other aspect of your library that you'd like feedback on. Um, but to think through d the different reasons why you might wanna collect data, you might want to be measuring impact. So impact on uh, the community, your library's impact on the community. That can be broad, could be taken in different directions based on what you want to know. Satisfaction, of course, is a big reason why we do surveys. How do your patrons and your stakeholders feel about your library? Uh, user needs. So what do your patrons need? How can your library meet that need? Are you meeting it currently or are there ways that you could be doing something different? New ideas, patrons suggesting new ideas for library programs and services. And then we have community happenings. What's going on in the community? How can your library be part of it? Where are some new partners that you might want to connect with? And then also getting just patrons' thoughts, feelings, beliefs, attitudes in relation to your services. So lots of different ways. And I think um, a good thing to remember here is that your survey could be a combination of these reasons. It doesn't necessarily have to land on one. Although, um, and now we'll kind of go forward. We do want to have a purpose and intent behind all of our survey design. So why, again, why give out a survey? What, what you're gonna do with the data should be a big part of the conversation and what you're going, what you want to know. So you want to think of maybe backwards design to help the, of this. So think of a goal or objective that you want to learn. Um, and then how do you get there? What do you need to ask? Who do you need to ask um, to uh, learn more, achieve your goal or objective? And um, I think the main thing also to consider too when when you're thinking of a survey is, um, you know, we want this to be impactful to our work, things that we can act on. Not everything maybe that you learn in a survey you can act on. We know lots of times people give 
uh, may give advice or feedback in a survey that library, like it's just not feasible, but it's nice to be able to create surveys with a purpose that you can act on them. Um, and I and also I want to just point out that this this does also relate to empathy mapping, community assessments. All of these tools can be used together to um, achieve a certain goal that you might have in your library. When you're also creating a survey, you'll want to think about time period. So, for example, you might want to hear from your patrons about what they think of your current program offerings. Um, current being the, the main uh, keyword of that sentence. So that's talking about present day, but you also might wanna know about past programs or even ideas for future programs. So it's nice to be able to, um, when you're considering your goals and objectives, reason for putting out the survey, what do you wanna know more about? Do you wanna know more about the past, the present or the future? So when we're thinking about that, we might think about question focuses in a few different categories. So behavior would be how someone uses the library. Um, and you can see the examples here. As a child, how often did you visit the public library might be a question you'd ask about that has more of a past. Um, or how often do you visit the public library? Is that present focused? Or future, do you plan to visit the public library in the next few months? And you can kind of run down with that idea in mind for these other categories too, like experiences. Experiences could be programs like story time, workshops you do in your library. You might ask, you know, what was it like attending a story time when you were a child? Now, a question like that might be hard for folks to answer if A, they didn't attend a story time as a child, or B, they don't remember, right? So thinking about, again, your goals, but it's an option. And then, of course, you've got your present, which might be asking about programs in the, in the present day that you offer, or even future programs you'd like to see in the future, which I think a lot of us like to know. We'd like to get patron feedback about what people like to see. Attitudes might be how people like coming to the library, what uh, beliefs of what they believe the library you know, stands for or what they want to see their library. Again, kind of the future focus, um, bring knowledge. So that might be, you know, wanting to know if people are using certain databases or if they would use certain databases if you got them. And then background and demographics. And that's the one where we're thinking about like, who's answering the questions. So that could be, you know, age, age, current age, or when was the first time you visited the library? When do you plan to retire? Those kinds of things. Um, again, thinking about the purpose and goal of your survey would inform how you want to ask questions. My recommendation is always to keep the survey in a specific time period, whether past, present, or future. Um, you could combine, but that would depend on what you want to know. And also, it could make a survey much longer to combine. So by choosing a focus, time period specifically present, future is probably more likely what people would want to have info on. That way you can narrow your questions and get the most important information out of your survey respondents. So past, present, or future, but um, kind of consider that when you're creating, when you're creating your survey. What do you need to create a survey? So um, of course, there's lots of steps to creating a survey. We're gonna talk about some of that here. Um, but generally what you'll wanna think about once you've got your idea, your objective, um, your goal for what you'd like to learn, you might wanna have a small group of people work on the survey. So maybe two or three people um, that can put out a draft and then you can have certain folks view the draft. And then eventually once the draft is the survey, you'll have folks test it. So that's sort of the, the structure you'll wanna think about. And we'll talk a little bit more in detail about that as we go. Um, other things you wanna think about is, will you need financial support for the survey? Depending on how you wanna deliver the survey, would you need access to a certain platform if it's online or other um, outreach 
uh, potentials that um, would get the survey out there. Um, may, may, there may be a cost to that. Who would administer the survey? Um, most times I would think it's probably your library, but depending on the group that you're surveying, you may want to partner with a community partner, or you may want to um, have someone else as kind of a third party administer a survey. Um, so those are things to consider. Um, and of course, of course, underlying all those things is, is cost. So that takes plays a big role. Um, small scale surveys, of course, would probably take less of that uh, thought process. If you're just doing something in house, you want to get feedback on something, but larger scale, those are some questions you'll want to think about. Who will participate? Um, consider who you want to reach with the survey. Um, is there a target group of people, or do you want to talk to the whole, want to hear from the whole town? Um, th th those are things that um, you'll want to consider. Um, if you're going to have non-English speakers taking the survey, you may need to have the survey translated into another language. So again, that could be um, a, a certain cost or another um, thing that you'll have to factor into when you build the survey. Um, so consider your folks um, while you're while you're building the survey. And I'll talk a little bit more about demographics and participants um, in a later slide. The types of surveys um, tend to fall with into two buckets, quantitative and qualitative. Um, the quantitative survey, um, and actually I should say too that lots of surveys are a mix of both of these types, so it's not really mutually exclusive, um, but we'll, I'll talk a little more about that. Uh, quantitative surveys uh, tend to identify trends, patterns, um, they mark change, they're usually numerical responses, so that means they're easy to quantify, analyze. Um, they can test out your you know, hypothesis, research question, objective, et cetera, uh, quantifiable. So for example, how often do you visit the library? Um, you might set up a, a multiple choice question style uh, to, for folks to give you a response. And then from there, you can view each choice as a total or an average, and you'd be able to make some um, and uh, conclusions and determinations off of that. Um, reasons why you'd want to use a quantitative survey, they can be a good choice for especially an initial survey. Um, maybe you actually have plans to do maybe a couple of surveys and you want them to build on one another. So starting off with a short quantitative survey could be a good choice that then you might build on and uh, in another quantitative follow-up survey. If you're looking for broader insights on what your patrons might need or want um, or view uh, or feel about the library, the quantitative survey is a good choice. As I mentioned, it can kind of map directly back to goals. Um, for example, if you were doing a survey about a survey of your town residents to find out who has a library card, that's a very one-to-one. Um, -one. You can find out how many people have it, exact number. The quantitative helps with that. It also maximizes survey responses. So people tend to take incomplete surveys that have limited answer choices rather than um, open-ended responses. So that is something to consider as well. Um, the qualitative side of things tends to capture information related more to feelings, behaviors, motivations. Uh, it can more directly tell a story of how you're uh, patrons or uh, feel about things. Um, you'll be looking for themes, patterns, similarities, differences based on qualitative data. Tends to be more of those open-ended questions. So for example, what's your favorite library program? People might give you lots of different responses to that. So you'll have more of a, um, in some ways, more of a specific feel, specific feelings from folks about what they like. Um, a few reasons why you might choose quantitative, qual excuse me, qualitative. So it gives context to quantitative questions. So for example, if you ask um, folks, um, how often do you visit the library? Um, you then might say, um, you know, what day of the week would you come? And then, oh, what programs do you attend? Some sort of building on that. And then they could write in the programs or, or something like that. 
And then, as I mentioned, it helps people, uh, qualitative questions help people under, help you understand how people feel the way they feel about your library, about your programs, about your services. Ideally, I think you probably have both in a survey. Qualitative does take more time to analyze and pull out those themes and stories. But a lot of the time you get very rich responses. So it really just depends on what you're looking for and, um, and how you want the information to be captured. And I'm gonna run through a number of survey design principles. Um, there are 13 here and there are overlap with these principles. Um, so you'll, you'll, you'll see that you'll probably think about a few of them at the same time. Um, so it's not really as linearly, uh, it's not as linear as I'm presenting it here today, but um, these are some things that you'll just be considering as you create and um, send out a survey. There are gonna be a few examples um, that I've sprinkled in uh, throughout that I'll ask for some feedback on. So some questions that aren't so good that might need to be edited. So I'd appreciate if you'd like to throw in the chat um, when those come, or you can also raise your hand whenever you're comfortable with. Um, so we've just got, uh, I'm just gonna read out briefly each one here and then I'll go into more depth. So survey questions match objectives, understanding your participants, using natural and familiar language, write clear, precise, and short questions, avoid leading or loaded questions, avoid double-barreled questions, Questions should go from more from simple to more substantial. Determine whether to use open-ended or closed-ended questions. Open-ended questions and closed-ended questions are a lot qualitative and quantitative, so I'll talk about that. Make sure closed-ended responses do not overlap and are exhaustive. Consider using different types of rating scales. Um, we'll talk about what rating scales are. Be mindful of length, organization, and format. Maintain an anonymity for participants, and then test out your survey. And then from there, we'll talk about um, administering the survey and analyzing. Oops, sorry about that. Okay, so the first one is survey questions match objectives. This is sort of what I've already talked about. What's your purpose? Are you looking to explore? Or are you looking to kind of confirm feelings? Um, or all of the other things that we talked about, what the why you might do a survey. Big one here is don't feel the need to reinvent the wheel. If someone else has done something similar at their library, ask to use it. We all know librarians are generally very great about sharing what works, what doesn't work, and a lot of their information. So do the same thing here. I think a lot of the time, although our libraries and our communities are very different, we might want to know very similar things about our communities. So Starting off with a template makes a lot of sense. So I, I highly encourage uh, that kind of, uh, kind of work. Understanding your participants. So we talked about um, identifying those participants who you want to answer your survey. Um, and once you've done that, you'll wanna think about what you already know about your uh, demographic. And I'm gonna talk about bias later, but bias does play into survey. I'm gonna say now that bias does play into all survey creation. It's really hard to avoid. We'll talk about ways to avoid afterwards, but this piece of it could bring in some bias. So you'll want to have maybe a couple of voices help you think about what you already know about your participants. And the only reason, and I should say the reason why you might want to do this is just so you have an, a sense of, again, who you're asking and, um, the reason for that, like why you're why you want to know from these particular folks, if you're looking at a specific uh, population. Um, make sure when you're creating your questions that you're thinking of your your population and you're empathizing enough, so you're creating something that you want folks to be able to answer. And from there, if there are roadblocks to for your participants when it comes to completing the survey, so are there reasons why? your pa patrons might not be able to complete the survey. And I was curious now um, if any of you have done a survey before or want to do one, um, just off the top of your head, 
what are some potential roadblocks to complete that your patrons could come across with completing a survey? You want to think about that for a minute and put in to the chat. But I'm curious to hear if anyone can think of any that might come up. And actually, Gail, I'm having trouble seeing the chat. So if you see anything, can you let me know? Will do. Thanks. And I and you can think about this for another minute too while I'm talking, but I think it's important to consider um, that not everyone will be able to answer your survey or things might come up. We yeah. have a couple actually in here now, Barbara. Um, so the first thing is lack of knowledge or familiarity with library services and programs. Yeah. The next one is a uh, language barrier. Actually, there's a few of those actually listed as being the um, one of the bigger issues. Yeah. Yes, right. Language barriers would be tough. And I mentioned before, you know, getting translations, translations of your survey would be, you know, ideal, but that's not always possible, probably for, for you. So um that that can be a challenge um, thanks for sharing if there's any others um let, you know feel free to put them in the chat so use natural and familiar language uh if we can right i know we all library we all like our um our jargon or um sometimes get lost in it um but we have to try to stay away from it as best we can when we're Creating surveys. So we're trying, we'll try to use language that the group understands. And if we do need to use jargon, we have to make sure we're defining it clearly so folks know what we mean. And here's back to kind of what we talked about before with participants. So considering some of those characteristics of your participants can also help you figure out like that natural familiar language. Um, and, and also, I think, uh, especially maybe cultural, um, age as well. So just, again, considering your participants and keeping that in mind when you're crafting your questions. Oh, and I do see one more thing in the chat here, digital delivery for folks who are not tech savvy. Yes, that's also a, a barrier. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about format, but that's something to consider. So as a follow-up to the natural language, we want to be able to write in clear, precise, and short, short, if we can, questions. Um, so all the meanings, again, be interpreted the same way, if we can include those definitions, as I mentioned on the last slide. And when I say keep questions as short as possible, it's only because a lot of the time, and you'll see this example here on the slide, things can get really confusing. And it's probably better to have more than one question that relate to one another kind of as follow-up um, than it is to have like a long drawn out question. So for example, over here, this question, the library's OPAC offers three ways for you to search for books. Each method will lead to the same result. Which search method do you most commonly use to search the OPAC? Are you satisfied with that method? I'm curious what folks think is wrong with this question if you want to write in the chat or how you might um, go about changing it. Um, so I can give you all a minute, but there's a it's a long question is one of them for sure. But um, is there anything that you could do to maybe improve this question or um, just based on what we've talked about so far? Well, yeah, they're coming in. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, there's a yeah, there's a few things on this one for sure. So um, we have defining OPEC. Um, you know, the acronym of that is a big no. It's too long. Um, a sentence uh, needs yep. to be simplified. And then I I actually had one myself that there's actually seems like two questions in there, but there's just yeah. a, it says yes or no for the answer yeah yeah it's confusing to the way it's written like how what they're actually looking for they're at looking for lots of things um yeah so uh this is a good example of just and i think we're all we can all be a bit guilty of this i think we we, we want to know all the answers we're librarians or we want to know how our patrons feel so 
we might feel pressured or or really um, eager to hear what they have to think. So we might pile in as much as we can. But in this case, of course, as many many said, OPEC's too confusing. So you'd want to divide uh, to define that. But then also, you want to think about the question itself. So what are you trying to look for here? Do you want to just know how folks use the library catalog? And that's probably the better way of saying it. And then the second part of is it, do you, I guess, do you like the library catalog? It's sort of confusing, satisfied. I'm not really sure, you know, what we're looking for there. So this is a good example of, again, trying to get the, to the crux of what you're asking um, your, um, your folks and what you actually want feedback on. And in this case, if you are thinking about, say, um, switching platforms for your library catalog or thinking of making some modifications on how people search, a question like this in some format could be useful. So again, purpose and intent always comes back to um, what just we want us to be thinking One about. more in there too oh, yeah. that um, sure. we have, I think, found. It was just haven't told what the three search methods are. Yeah. Yeah, right. Also have to be clear about what we mean. And actually it's good. This is why it's good to have a number of different people look at questions too. We'll talk about the piloting thing, but it's a good reminder here just now, like it's easy for us to assume that we, because we know what we mean, but obviously other people might not. So. Um, avoid lo leading or loaded questions. Um, these are two kind of similar but different types of questions that you might have seen on surveys before. I think it's really easy to write these kinds of questions. So loaded questions contain words that can create a positive or a negative reaction from a participant. So for example, don't you agree that public libraries deserve more funding from the federal government? Of course, but we're trying to, that question's leading someone into thinking something specific about libraries deserving funding. A leading question, uh, and that's a low, and that one is loaded because it's trying to get positive or negative reaction, although I, I did just say leading, so that's why they're, they're very similar. Um, and then leading questions are phrased in a way that suggests a certain answer. So if the library was open on Sundays, would you visit? You know, people might, or maybe they won't, but you're sort of trying to say, like, kind of suggest Oh, would you like to? Oh, okay. Yes, I would like to. Even if maybe they don't, they are, even if maybe they actually wouldn't. Um, so I'm curious um, if you have any ideas about how we might rewrite these questions that they would be less leading people to certain answers or loaded or, or very loaded, causing that positive or negative, a very positive or very negative reaction. Public, public libraries deserve more funding, right? <laughs> yeah, that seems a little uh, loaded to our leading, but I get what you mean. <laughs> oh, I think we have a hand raised. Yeah, uh, Lynn? Hi, yeah. So Hi. I just have a question about the Sunday one. Um, yeah. To me, that sounds, to, I, don't, I don't feel that that sounds leading. Um, okay, that's fair. I mean, to me, that sounds pretty neutral. So what, yeah, what, yeah what, think, you, what are your thoughts about how it sounds leading? I think the reason why I'm saying it's leading is because we're kind of pointing out a certain day specifically. Um, and we're, and then, and, and also um, depending on how you write. So depending on how you write the answers to this question, if you want someone to say yes or no, um, could, could make people feel like, well, sure, I might come on to the library if it was open on Sundays. I guess everybody might, you know what I mean? Um, I think a better way of asking that um, probably is to um, more generalize and say something like, um, the library is thinking of expanding hours. Um, and you might say, like, depending on what days you're open, like, or not opened or hours, you might give people options of like, 
Sundays or evenings or, you know, something more like that, where it's a little bit more um, them choosing um, based on how their own feelings versus like your Sundays. Does that make sense? I, I do think that this question isn't terrible, but I did want to include it as something to consider in terms of how you're asking people um, certain, like for certain information. Or how about like if, if instead of the way it's worded now, if we said, do you feel that the library should be open on Sundays? Mm, yeah. And then maybe. it could be a little, it could be an open-ended question maybe and give people a chance to actually write how they feel. I like that. It's a little bit better. Thanks, Lynn. That's appreciated. Thank, thank you. Uh, Robin second, had everyone? something in chat. From the chat? Just, yeah. It's just a little audience. different too, which I, um, well, it, besides the, what days do you visit the library? Um, is the library open when you're available to visit? Which I kind of like that one. Mm, yeah, I like that too. Oh, I also, I, I'm just seeing too, Robin's saying, you know, don't ask questions you don't want answered. If you can't open mm -hmm. on Sundays, don't ask. Yeah, that's true. And actually that's a good just point for generally speaking questions because we don't want to promise people things, of course, that we know we can never do. If there, you know, if there's a way to do certain things, of course, we'd like to hear from folks and it's a good data point that you could present to some, the folks who make those decisions. But of course, if it's just never possible, then that that's important too. Thanks everybody for those. Um, so now avoiding double barreled questions. This is where you might combine two or more issues or topics into a single question. We kind of saw that a little bit before with the OPAC, but this is um, even more kind of differentiating. So you might have see people who feel differently about those two different issues, and then they wouldn't know how to answer the question. So for ex the example here is, what's your level of agreement with the following statement? All library staff should be trained to use AEDs and administer Narcan. Well, those two are different things. So folks might feel comfortable with one and not the other, or they might, you know, vice versa. So you'll want to avoid creating questions that include that and or or, because that could lead to this sort of situation. And as we mentioned before with the last slide, but definitely in this case, it seems like if you want to know about those two different things, you'd need to ask them in two different questions. So when we're creating surveys, um, a good rule of thumb is to think about starting off with more simple questions and then heading into more substantial questions. Um, a lot of the reason for this is because survey fatigue is something that definitely happens. And if you have a little bit of a longer survey, that could, uh, and then it starts off with all these really sort of maybe difficult, quest difficult questions for people, it might decide, they may decide, oh, okay, I'm not going to answer this because I don't, I don't want to. Um, so by starting with those simple questions, hopefully you're less likely to trigger those uh, confusions. And actually that's probably the biggest thing is if you're starting off with more like substantial, potentially more complicated questions, people might feel confused. And so they might just say, I don't feel like taking this survey and abandon it. Um, so starting off with a little bit easier questions kind of gets, uh, gets, might get people more comfortable and then they'll be more likely to finish. Um, still, however, you'll want to put important questions toward the top because, you know, you want people to answer certain questions. And we do know that most people, uh, uh, not most, but some people might not just not finish a survey anyway because they just don't want to or they don't feel like they have anything to contribute to certain questions as it goes along. So it's it's a balance, but it does help to think about it as sort of a simple to substantial um, uh, kind of line when you're creating your surveys. And this is again, a good point for when you're testing your survey. So folks who test their survey can give you some insight onto that and help you with that general flow of how you um, organize your uh, questions. Now here, um, open-ended and closed-ended questions. This again relates back to those qualitative and quantitative principles. Um, that I talked about before. So when we're talking about open-ended questions, that's giving people the ability to respond however they want, whereas those closed-ended quantitative 
um, require participants to choose from a number of responses. And I'm bringing this up again just to remind folks that um, these two options are uh, can be on any survey, both at the same time, and that specifically I'm going to actually move to the next slide. But so open ended is that what ways has the visiting library helped you complete assignments, and then the close ended, you've got your limited responses. But um, what I want to say here is that you want to be exa as exhaustive as you can with those closed-ended questions. Um, and if you feel like you're still missing things, that other category can be, whoops, let me go back, sorry. Uh -oh. The other category um, can be really useful. And I think most of the time you see that on um, some of cl some closed-ended questions, just because then you have that free write spot that can catch other responses you might not have thought of. So this question, like which of the following ways has visiting the library after school helped you complete assignments? We have a list here, like use computers, meeting a tutor study group classmate, library resources, getting assistance from library staff. But there might be other reasons that we're not thinking of here. These are maybe the main ones. So that other catches um, those other things that people use the library for when it comes to completing assignments. Um, so using other um, is recommended. And along those same lines, when you're thinking of closed-ended questions, you want to make sure that your categories don't overlap and you can offer all legitimate responses. So this happens, this would be like, you know, for example, like an age question like I have here. You want to make sure you're covering all your age ranges so people feel like, you know, oh, I have a, I have a spot. Um, and that's mainly just review, like making sure you're um, when you're reviewing your survey, oh, by accident, we forgot the 55 to 64 category or something like that. So that uh, those close-ended responses um, are uh, giving you all, all of your options. And that I should say too, is why sometimes maybe you, want, you might go in a direction of an open-ended question because there may be just too many possibilities for people to choose from. So that's when you might, that might be your tipping point is like, you know, okay, I really want to hear from folks about why they use the library after school. I'm not sure I have enough here or it's not giving me a clear picture. So I'd like people just to write about what they do. Um, this gets into a little bit of like other types of survey questions. We've been talking about a lot about those closed ended, open ended. So rating scales, which you might have seen on surveys, um, do get used as maybe a section of a survey um, or maybe even a whole survey, depending on how you set it up. But basically it's a continuum of choices that respondents can use to indicate how they feel about something. So you've got numeric rating scales. So that's like usually a one through five. Sometimes it's a seven point, depends on how you structure it. Um, but usually one through five, and that would be, you know, one is maybe, four to five excellent, um, and you're using numbers to, to show that off. The descriptive scale is, sim is very similar, but you're using language, so four to excellent in that case. Um, so those do do basically the same thing. The Likert scale is that agree, disagree. Um, I feel like I see that one quite a bit, and that's where that five point or seven point usually um, comes into play. Um, and when you're adding in something else, it's sometimes like somewhat agree and then and then agree and then strongly agree for, and then it might be somewhat disagree, strongly agree or agree, strongly agree. Um, and then you might have like that neutral one in the middle. So it depends, but the Likert is that agreement agreement scale. Then you have rankings which would be, say you give folks a list of your services, like you've got self-checkout, you've got a hold shelf, you've got um, maybe um, pick, uh, curbside pickup or some, some, some sort of list of related services. And then you might ask folks to list um, with numbers their important, uh, importance, one through five usually, um, no more than five, because um, then you're kind of getting a little bit too large, the rankings help do that. And as I mentioned, the scales are usually four and they could be up to 11 points, but I, I think that's probably too, too many 11. So kind of stick more in a five or seven point range. 
And as far as the middle point goes, that neutral response, um, it can be tricky because sometimes folks have a new, uh, choose neutral when they don't know how they feel, which would make sense, but, or maybe they don't have an opinion. And sometimes I, I've seen that folks choose that just to get done with a survey, maybe too, because it's easier. Um, so you have to just use your judgment, whether you um, are okay with having folks be neutral on the question, which is absolutely fine if that, if that's how you, how, you know, if that's how folks feel. And so that might determine whether or not you add in that neutral response. But if you really want folks to give, be kind of put in a position where they have to give an opinion, then you'll take that out of it. Um, I think you could go either, either way. Um, I, uh, in a previous position, I, we did a, a staff survey, satisfaction survey, and folks, we did decide to put a neutral in there because we felt like some folks um, would not and would not care maybe one way or another about certain questions. And also we felt like in that case that it, when people had opinions, we would hope that they were giving them. Um, so they would put agree or disagree. Um, and so we felt like the neutral option to give people a chance to say, yeah, you know, what? I just don't care about, care about that certain thing. So it really depends on your audience and how, what kind of information you want to get out. Um, mindful of length, organization, and format. Uh, so we're heading into um, more of structure now. As I mentioned, most important questions should come first. Your demographic questions should be last. So ending with those, you know, age, if you're asking that, or where you live, or um, I don't, maybe have, you know, what, uh, where um, <laughs> I'm blanking, but other demographic questions like that might I, not necessarily identify people, but give you an idea of your participants. Um, another good thing to keep in mind when you're creating your survey is to think about grouping questions by topic and using headings. So that way it's very clear about what you're asking and what parts of the survey, which parts of the survey are there and that'll give people a good idea of what you're looking for. Instructions are really important. We saw it before in, a, in that question where we weren't defining something, but just generally speaking, we'll want to make sure that folks understand what the survey, what the survey is. You also might wanna include a purpose. Why are we doing this survey? Some people might really wanna know, and it might also be the uh, tipping point of why they may or may not decide to answer. So that can be really helpful. But yeah, being clear about how you want someone to fill out the survey is important. Um, the rule of thumb is to try to keep a survey length to 10 to 15 minutes to complete, especially if you're not giving incentives. I don't know that you need incentives. I think sometimes it helps, but um, I think like, you know, if that's not part of a budget or it's not something you can do, then, you know, that's okay, I think. so. I don't, I can, I don't consider incentives like a big push. I don't know that it gets a lot of people to fill something out. Maybe it does. Maybe it depends on your community or who you're asking. But at, at any rate, keeping in mind, if you didn't have an incentive, the shorter the survey, the better. And then finally, with format, um, this is tricky. I know someone said before, you know, a digital uh, or online survey might be, um, a barrier for folks in their community. Um, so this is something to think about. Do you offer it both ways, print and online? Or do you, you know, um, try it one way? And if it's not working, think about, you know, another way. It really depends on, again, your population. And you would all know best about that. Um, and I actually do think multiple formats probably make the most sense in this and in, in this case, just because I do think there are some people you'll catch online, but then there's lots of folks who come into your library daily, and they also might just be best to have something there for folks to take and fill out. So it really just depends on your what what you're what you're hoping to get out. Oh, I do see something in the chat. Robin said, "I have found in my experience with surveys, the more choices are given, the fewer responses you'll get. People want simple." Yeah, thanks, Robin. That's actually a really good point. 
discipline, I agree. I think sometimes people get overwhelmed with those seven point Likert scales. And so again, knowing your audience and knowing what people are comfortable with really helps in that case. So yeah, giving less, less choices are prob is, probably, um, is probably helpful. Um, so maintaining anonymi anonymity for participants. Sometimes it's not possible, especially if you're doing a survey with a small group of folks who um, use a particular service you wanna know more about, but I think you need to strive for it as much as possible. It really helps. I think people are more apt to fill out surveys when they know their name or their any um, super identifying information um, is attached. So don't ask for names, don't ask for potential identifying information. Um, if you're giving out a paper survey, you can ask your patrons, you know, please don't fill it out right here at the desk. Can you go, you know, to another location and then maybe have a space to drop off those paper surveys in a spot that's, you know, not right next to the CERC desk or something like that. So you're not really seeing who's putting things in. Um, I think it just makes people feel better and people probably be more honest if um, they're not feeling like it's, you know, going to get traced back. So. Although I'm sure some people don't care if, if they if if they're if they know if you know that they filled it out, but I think generally speaking, it's a good idea to try to not have any particularly identifying information. Um, and also, uh, we'll have a slide in a minute that talks about analyzing results. I think it's easy to um, maintain anonymity as well in results when you're generalizing group responses, and that way it's not particularly attached to a certain person. So that's another way of making sure things stay anonymous. I mentioned this before, and I'll reiterate, all surveys have some element of bias. There's really nothing we can do about it. We're all biased in our own ways inherently, but there are some ways we can limit the bias that happens in surveys. So as we mentioned before, try to stay away from leading or loaded questions. Um, try to include positive and negative tone questions, meaning, you know, um, if you're phrasing a question a certain way that will elicit a positive response, maybe you'll also want to include questions that you think might also um, bring out a negative response, and that way you're kind of balanced in what you're hearing from folks. Be careful of your word choice, as we said, use inclusive language, um, and acknowledge assumptions you might already have about participants. Of course, we, we do have assumptions about our patrons. Um, just based on working, you know, working and being with them in the library. So um, if we can acknowledge those and understand that, you know, okay, we might see this or we might hear this answer, then we know that, you know, that that's what might happen. And then, of course, thinking about your demographics. And that comes back to what we said before about um, identifying participants and making sure maybe that you have a group of folks who are um, diverse in, in many different ways that can give you um, good different kinds of uh, feedback and voice on your survey. Pilot the survey. This is sort of when you're rounding out toward the end. When possible, pilot your survey before administering it. Try to get five or 10 people, five to 10 people to try it out. If you don't have that many people to try it out, as many people as you can, that seems feasible, try it out. Get a few different eyes on it. Maybe even get folks within your partition, people like your partition, this, excuse me, your participation group, get folks like that. If not, also, you could also have like a staff member look at it, or even someone you know that's sort of a third party. Just good to get a number of different eyes on a survey before you give it out. Um, you can ask for feedback. You can ask people kind of, to, uh, you can also be in a room with someone while they're testing it and ask them to think aloud while they're filling it out. That can be helpful. You could do a debrief if they fill it out on their own afterwards. Completely up to you how you want to do it. The feedback you get from folks is important, um, but in the end, you have to choose how you modify it based on what your objectives are, because at the end of the day, you know most what you want to hear. So if um, folks are going to give you feedback, you'll want to weigh it against what you want to know. But again, feedback is good and multiple eyes are good. Um, I'm, since we're kind of getting close to the end here, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about sample size and such, but it is something for you to be aware of. I will share these slides afterwards, um, so you can take a look at this slide a little more carefully if you're interested. 
But basically, we talk a little bit about format here, um, what kind of methods um, you would like to send out. You know, maybe you have a, an email chain in person, as I mentioned before, a link on your website, a newsletter, mail. I'm not sure if phone would be so, so easy to do in this day and age, but um, those are a number of different options. And again, I think combinations of that probably make the most sense based on um, your uh, group of participants. And as I said, sample size, it is something to consider if you're doing a large scale survey. Um, if you're doing something that, of course, that you're targeting, you know, the whole town, you might want to think about how many people, you know, the sample size would kind of give us the confidence that this is a good um, representation of how the town feels. So there's some information here. Again, I'll share the slides. And there's calculators online like Qualtrics. I have a link in the slide that can help you do that. So if you're if you're doing a larger scale survey, that's something to consider. Have an end date. Your survey can't stay open forever. So once you've created a timeline, try to be cognizant of that. If you do decide to extend a survey timeline, just be clear about it. Have a new end date, stick to that end date. Um, you can't have surveys stay open forever because then you may not ever be able to truly um, analyze and act on what you've asked. So it's good to just keep a timeline, keep a, a structure. And that way you'll be able to have a, a structure to analyze the data, act on the data, follow up on the data. Almost out of time. So I'll just briefly say, you know, when you're analyzing data, qualitative, quantitative, it's always a nice idea to throw things into Excel, get some, um, in this case, this would be sort of a, a quanti quanti quantitative example, put in your numbers, percentages really help because it gives you a better picture about how often something was selected. Be transparent about your responses. Some questions might not get answered by every single person who takes it, so you'll want to think about it when you're analyzing um, the number. Um, oh, okay, we had 273 answer this question, but in the next one, it was only 250. So that keeps you um, kind of honest about how many um, responses you actually received versus like that overall of how many people took the survey. Qualitative responses will need some coding, meaning that you'll just want to, if people um, wrote you open-ended questions, you'll want to find the similarities in those open-ended responses and kind of clock, uh, oh, okay, you know, everybody's talking about a certain program that's going to be the response and you kind of put them under that and you go from there. Sharing what you learned, charts are good, <laughs> graphics are good. It really comes down to knowing your audience. So, and you also might have a number of different audiences that you want to share results with. So you might use charts, infographics, you might write out a report, you might give a presentation. There's a lot of ways you can share with folks. Um, what you learn. Uh, but I also really want to emphasize act on your data. Some of it might not be feasible to act on. Some of it might have to be long, more long-term goals, but that's okay. You've collected all this data, so don't let it sit in a file on your computer or in a folder on the desk. Save it, get, refer to it again later when it makes sense. Um, things don't have to happen right away, like I said. Long term is fine, but this is important. This is important data. It's great that you collected it, so use it when you can use it. Um, and I'm going to wrap up here and say um, we can help. I'm available to consult on survey design, analysis, et cetera. Um, I also wanted to shout out this upcoming webinar um, from Gail and Dawn on target audience and empathy mapping, which again is very much related to survey design. So if you're interested in that kind of um, community, you know, community uh, focus and figuring out what your community needs, those tools can also be useful. So we're wrapping up. It was a little bit of a quick um, end and I probably could get into more of an analysis and maybe I will in a future webinar. But I'd love to hear if anyone has any questions in the couple minutes we have left or any comments or anything you'd like to share.
Oh, I see a question from Ro Robin, I think. When using scales, do we choose one or vary it? Um, good question. Um, I think if you're you, I think I would try to stick with like one scale um, in a survey just because it could get confusing. However, if you have clear sections, you could change it up in, the, in a section. Um, uh, but definitely be clear about what you're looking for. And I don't know necessarily that'd be a great idea to say like, start off with a five point ranking in, in, the, in, in one question and switch to a seven in another, because I think that would be very confusing. So um, just, keep, just keep that in mind. And uh, Lynn has her hand up. Yeah, Lynn. So this is just a comment um, from the perspective of like take a, a survey taker. Mm, I, yeah. find, I find that sometimes the survey creators don't put a don't put a an option for like not applicable. Oh yeah, good point. Which makes it hard to fill out, and then sometimes that affects um, you know further questions down the line where yeah maybe this one wasn't applicable so then you can't answer the next one but but like you you can't yeah. finish the thing because it's it won't let you finish the thing unless mm. you do something yes yes i didn't talk about that but that's a really good point um not applicable is a good category to have also if you're doing an online survey and maybe this is what you're alluding to too if you have someone select no or not applicable then they don't have to answer you can have questions kind of not show up um, that's very, that's very helpful too, um, depending on uh, responses. Actually, I would say sometimes the neutral spot, if it's, um, not, a, uh, instead of having maybe a neutral spot, sometimes not applicable might be, might be a good option as well. Yeah. Thanks for the comment. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Okay. Well, we're at 11. So, um, if there's anything else, um, Feel free to reach out to me uh, again if you're if you're thinking of doing a survey or you're in the midst of a survey or you'd like any feedback, please let me know. I'm happy to help. Um, thank you all for being here today. Appreciate it.